Okay, stay. Ah. It's on. That's good. Okay, good morning all of you. Morning. I'm really pleased to see you and I'm also pleased to see all of you who are with us from around the world. Uh, you're very welcome and we look forward to have your comments and observations and questions so that we can all join into this, what I think, very important subject. Now, this, my name is Lars Kohlind and I am here uh, as a business person. So I've taken off my scout uniform, uh, and now I try to look uh, like a business person. Uh, uh, my experience in, in, in business is from running a number of large corporations, global corporations, but also from starting new businesses. And uh, I have started a total of 26 new businesses in a wide range of fields. Some have been successful, others have been failures. Uh, and I'm proud to be one of the persons that have failed the most times. But I've also been reasonably successful. Uh, I've also run a large uh, public institution. Uh, so I, I dare say that I think I have a broad background for sharing with you my, uh, what, how I would look upon scouting as a business person. I should say before I start that currently I'm spending a lot of time in China uh, helping CEOs from Chinese businesses to learn how to run or to develop their companies from manufacturing for the home market into becoming world-class global corporations being able to compete with the world market leaders around the world, which is a, a fascinating challenge. So that's uh, my job. Uh, I would like to uh, start with a small calculation. Uh, the theme of uh, this morning's session is the impact of scouting. And the impact of scouting is something that we are not really used to express as scouts. We all agree it's great. Uh, Abdullah, there's space up here. And Vemund, space up here. Ah, you would rather sit in the back. Okay. Uh, we're not really used to quantifying the impact of scouting. We all know it's great. But if you come from outside, you would like to have a better understanding, really, of why it is so great. We have space up here for the latecomers. Uh, and I'd like to do a calculation. If you think of a young scout, uh, this young scout would normally stay with us for about five years. Could be four, but let's say five years. Uh, during that period of time, this person, this young person, will have spent approximately one thousand active hours being a scout. One thousand hours. And 
what will that person have been doing during those 1,000 hours? This person will have done camping, will have done hiking, will have learned to find his or her way. If I say his, I always mean his or her. But uh, uh, I may forget the her. So this person will have learned a lot of things, done a lot of different things uh, during those 1,000 hours. And if we are to summarize what that young pe person has learned, I would take the five skills that Chris Lonsdale uh, mentioned to us because I think those five essential skills express very well what a young person learns from all these activities. And they are creative problem solving. Creative problem solving is what you do all the time, every day in scouting. You are confronted with a challenge and you need to find a solution individually or more often in a group. The second thing is that the young person learns uh, to have self-belief, self-confidence. And this is especially true when you realize that you can actually do this 40 kilometer or 80 kilometer hike, or you can build this tower, or you can do this bridge, or whatever you do, you discover that you can do much more than you thought you could do, and especially much more than your mum thought you could do. So you gradually develop self-confidence. The third point is that all the time in scouting, we learn by doing, which is why we learn what's called self-directed learning. And that was number three, which Chris Lonsdale mentioned as the essential skills for people. The fourth skill he mentioned was communications. And since scouting is so much of a small group exercise, it is obvious that you cannot be a scout without practicing how to communicate. The fifth skill was emotional intelligence. And that is acquired through scouting because in the patrol, you need to take advantage of every single member's strengths. And by doing that, you have to connect with the person, to understand the person, to, to respect the person. And by working together, you develop particularly emotional it, intelligence. So imagine a young person who has spent 1,000 hours learning with his brain his, and his whole body those five essential skills. That is a huge impact on that person. Some of us stay longer, uh, not because it took us longer to learn it, but because we loved it so much that we stayed longer, and of course we benefited more. Others stayed not so long and benefited less. But as an average, a person that has gone through five years of that sort of training has really, really acquired a lot, and we have had a huge impact on that person. That is a micro perspective. Now, let us do the macro perspective. We have roughly 40 million scouts around the world. And if they stay an average of five years, we have 8 million graduating from scouting each year. On average, they will stay for 50, 60 years. So on average, there will probably be around 500 million people mostly adults, in the world that has gone through this training and has learned, they have learned these basic skills. They have been enabled to act as active citizens and leaders of positive change. Now just imagine that number, 500 million people who are capable, who act as active citizens, and who are capable of leading positive change. That is huge. So comparing our impact with any company, government, other NGO, I think will favorably come out that scouting is probably one of the most important and impactful organizations whatsoever in the world.
That's how I would look upon it as a business person. I tried to relate it to my own village. I live in the countryside, and my village has about 7,000 inhabitants. And this happens to be one millionth of the world. Now, if this tiny place was average from a scouting point of view, with 7,000 people, there would be 500 of them who had been able or had or would be acting as active citizens and leaders of positive change. 500 people in my small village. And if you take a uh, look upon these 500, probably 100 of them, one in five, will take some, will have some sort of leadership position. And since I calculate that in my village there are 200 people who have some sort of leadership role, it is half of the leaders in my village who have become able to act as active citizens and leaders of positive change. Imagine the impact that has on the life of our village. In fact, I think in our village there are no, not about 500, I think there are about 1,000 and I can't find many leaders who have not been scouts, but that's because we've always had a very strong scouting tradition in that village. Just, uh, so did you get it? One half of all leaders in the world probably have some sort of scouting background. That's a lot. If you take a slightly larger perspective, and look upon your country. I will look upon my country, which is Denmark, with five million inhabitants. It is striking that when you talk to the 100 most, most successful and most well-respected business people, and I've done that, and I've asked every single one of them, were you a scout? 70% said yes. My next question, by the way, was, would you like to partner with scouting, support scouting, become a Baden-Powell fellow? And about 50% said yes. Not too bad. You can do the same thing. So the point about having, about assuming that about half of our leaders worldwide have been scouts is not completely off. It is the percentage is higher in Denmark, and I think that is one of the expressions why Denmark is the happiest people on earth. <laughs> and Denmark enjoys more global brand, successful, world-leading global brand businesses like almost any other place with the same number of people. And I shall just mention some of the Danish world-leading global brands, and you'll be surprised of how many there are in just five million people. I can mention Lego, Maersk, the largest shipping line, the largest wind turbine manufacturer, actually two of the three largest, which is Vestas and Siemens Wind Power, three of the world's five leading hearing aid companies are from Denmark. There are uh, the, leader, the world leader in pumps, water pumps, Grundfos, is Danish. The world leader in uh, uh, energy or heat uh, control, Danfoss, is Danish. Uh, the world leader in advanced and high-end audiovisual equipment, Bang & Olufsen, is Danish. And there are many, many others. So I think, I cannot prove that, that must have something to do with the fact that not only 50%, but probably 70% of our leaders have a scouting background. So, <clears throat> my conclusion is, when it comes to impact, that scouting has a much, much larger impact than we ourselves believe, and indeed what people around the world who are not scouts believe. We are probably the most impactful, influential youth movement or movement any, any way in the world. And we should be very proud of that. 
our challenge is that we don't act like one. Or I should say you, since now I'm a businessman, uh, I should say you guys, you don't act like a winner. And I'd like to, ad uh, to give you some advice, some recommendations from a businessman on how to act as a winner. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that a winner should always uh, evaluate whether he or she is in, an, in, a, in a market that is with having an upward trend or if you're sort of in a dying business. My conclusion is that scouting is, is more relevant today than it's ever been and it will become more relevant in the future. And that has to do with the fact that the very nature of work changes. I'm fully aware that scouting is not a top leader management program, uh, not at all. Scouting is a program that enables us to function as active citizens and leaders of positive change, which of course is also, and that's the first thing, leaders of positive change in our own life. Not only our work life, but as our li in our li life as a whole. So uh, the fact that I'm now focusing on work does not limit the, the purpose of scouting to work. There's much more to it. But uh, if you look at the future of work, what we're seeing is that the repetitive, stupid work where a person just stands in front of a machine and does sort of the same thing, which is the classical type of work at the assembly line, is rapidly decreasing, even in China. Rapidly decreasing, and work that humans will be faced to do is knowledge work and service work, which has a completely different uh, context and content. The second thing uh, is that individual work, which is what you do when you stand at that machine, is actually being substituted more and more by collective work. So being able to work together becomes more and more important. The third point is that everything changes and therefore a person that is able to perform self-directed learning is at the core of what society needs. And last but not least, since issues are becoming much more complex, you cannot, as a leader, make all the decisions on behalf of your staff. You have to be able to include your staff and work together uh, and draw up a vision and create ownership of that vision. These are the things that you need to be able to do for a team of people to be able to solve complex issues such as sustainability, environment, peace, uh, uh, complex products, complex services, etc. And if you think of these four aspects of the work of tomorrow, you will realize that the five skills that scouting teaches or that people acquire through scouting is exactly what's needed to function in tomorrow's workplace. So we are actually in a market that works to our advantage. The second thing is that we apply a method which is actually becoming more relevant than it was when Baden-Powell designed it from the beginning. And I will compare the scout method with a conventional school. In the conventional school, the teacher teaches and conveys information that he or knowledge that he, has, he or she has and fills it, opens your brain, fills it in as quickly as possible and make sure you don't forget it. That is the conventional mindset of a school. While in scouting, the, the focus is on the scout learning 
in his own speech, uh, in his own speed, and according to his passion and interest. And cognitive science today knows that that is a much better approach. People learn when they're interested, they learn it at, in their own pace, and they learn based on what they particularly know and, and did know on beforehand. The second thing is that in schools, uh, teaching is focused on helping the young person to pass the exam and get the credit. In scouting, the motivation is totally different because scouts do what they think is fun. Uh, they focus on what they're interested in, what gives them meaning, what, what they feel is relevant, so that there is an internal motivation for the scout, but there's an external motivation for most schools. And again, cognitive science shows that learning takes pl place much more efficiently once the motivation is internal. Uh, the, the third point I'd like to mention is that young people go to school because they have to. Most people don't go there voluntarily. They have to. It's an obligation. It's a duty. And it's compulsory. Scouts uh, perform scouting because they love to do it. They're interested. It's fun. And cognitive science knows that you learn much more if you're happy, if you think it's fun, than if you're obliged to do it. And last but not least, schools focus on learning through your eyes and ears. So schools treat you as you, the person is only what's above this line, while scouting uh, addresses the whole body, and you learn with all your senses, both with body and brain. And cognitive science knows that that's a much better approach. So it's interesting. When Baden-Powell designed scouting, more than 100 years ago, he actually, there wasn't all that cognitive science that way, but he simply, he studied and consulted the best uh, professionals and uh, academics at that time, including Maria Montessori. But basically, he made the choice based on what he had experienced would work. And later, science has shown that that is the right way to do it. While schools were created the way they are now, based on what the uh, on an industrial mindset, based on the assembly line concept, and cognitive science has later shown that that is not a good way of ha ma uh, enabling young people to learn. So, scouting should be proud of what it's doing. It should offer its help to schools to enter into the 21st century. And it should not try, which happens in some places, to copy the way schools work. We have a better way of doing it. So let us act uh, in that way. Uh, if you look at Scouting's product, when you ask, and I asked you before we started, uh, to think of how would you explain what scouting is all about to somebody who had never heard about it before. And I've asked that question to a lot of people over time, and I'm, I'm getting more or less the same reply, which is that people tend, scout leaders, tend to define scouting from the activities that we perform. And they think it's a disaster if we take away this particular activity that they performed when they were scouts. Uh, and uh, the fact that somebody takes it away is a disaster. But frankly speaking, scouting should not be designed by what it does. It should be defined by why it exists. And I know I've said that many times. I'd say it several times again. I'd say, in my view, the best way to abbreviate our long mission and vision and what have you statements is to simply say that scouting 
enables young people to act as active citizens and leaders of positive change based on shared values. That's what scouting is all about. So scouting is indeed the greatest leadership development program on the planet. This is why scouting exists. And this is the core of the definition of scouting. Part of that de definition is also how it works, which is the scout method. And you know the five, six, or seven, depending on, on how you divide. But there are a number of elements in the scout methods which are part of the de definition of scouting. It happens, if possible, out of doors. It happens in small groups. It's based on learning by doing. The role of the leader is somebody that will follow and encourage rather than just go forward and, 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 uh, and ask everybody to follow him uh, or her. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, includes a progressive system of a wide range of activities where the, the individual person, uh, the scout, will uh, learn gradually and actually compete more with him or herself than compete with others. In the school, there are winners who pass the exam with flying grades and losers who don't. In scouting, everybody can be a winner. So the scout method is an important part of the definition of scouting as well. But if you look at the three, the why, the how, and the what, we should be pragmatic and willing to change the what, which is the activity. Which means that if there's a new technology or whatever comes in, like mobile, phone, or Facebook, or what have you, we should not try to get people away, young people away from it. We should embrace it and use it to our advantage. And if you think that's a strange idea I have gotten, it actually is not. There's a wonderful uh, sequence in Baden-Powell's first uh, leadership or leader training handbook, Aids to Scout Mastership, in 1919, where he addresses exactly that problem, where he says, that many scout leaders are concerned about the fact that young people tend to go to the cinema instead of going to scouts. And he says a bad scout leader will try to force the young people not to go to the cinema and to force them into scouting instead. A good scout leader would try to find out how he or she could actually take advantage of the cinema to enrich scouting. And you can just substitute cinema with Facebook, and then you have it. Facebook, I think, is wonderful. Scouting was Baden-Powell's Facebook 100 years ago. Fantastic. It was not my idea, but it was a wonderful quote from uh, yesterday's conference. So we should embrace new activities. And if something is too old-fashioned, throw it out. So we should be pragmatic and willing to change activities frequently. We should also be uh, willing to change our method if there are things that, do, that don't work anymore. That is not the case, to the best of my knowledge. But we should very rarely change, uh, and we should be very stubborn about the purpose of what we're doing, which means that we are an educational movement, and our product is people that are able to blah, blah, blah. That's really what we are, which means that we are not primarily a peace movement. We're not primarily an environment uh, action movement. We're not primarily a community development and poverty movement. We are a leadership development program. And all these aspects are aspects of good leadership. And therefore, they are part of our purpose. But the primary purpose is leadership. And a good leader, of course, acts sustainably, creates peace, takes advantage of diversity, helps people get, become employable, and what have you. All of this. But this is part of something greater, which is to develop young people into individuals that act as active citizens and leaders of positive change based on the shared values. So, my recommendation to you in closing, and then it's up for discussion, and you guys out there, 
are welcome to join in as well. My recommendation to you is, first of all, focus everything you do. Not only the way you talk about scouting, but focus everything you do in scouting on the core purpose of the whole thing, which is educational. And focus everything you do on developing those young people who can act as active citizens and leaders of positive change. That's the only purpose we have. The second thing that I would uh, advise you to is to strengthen and differentiate scouting more. Don't make it look like anything else. Be incredibly proud of what makes us stand out and being unique. So sharpen the knife. Don't just cut anything with it. Sharpen it. Because it is the best program that has ever been designed. And uh, the third and last recommendation is believe in yourself. You know, if you think of scouting and you act like we are a marginalized group and nobody understands how important we are and you're desperately seeking accreditation and recognition from others because nobody takes you serious, etc. If you act like that, you are a loser and you will remain a loser. If you act like being part of the greatest leadership development program on the planet, you should look like it, you should act like it, you should believe in what you're doing, and you should invite the most prominent, the most powerful, the most wealthy uh, companies and individuals to partner with you. Not the second class people, the first class people. Make them partner with you. And who would say no to partnering with the greatest leadership development program on earth? Nobody would. Just to strengthen that point, one more time, I would like you to think of what is the purpose of amnesty? What's the cause that they are working for? They are working for protection of human rights, which is fine. What is the cause of Greenpeace? You know, they, uh, they fight for a better environment against pollution and what have you which is fine. What is the cause of scouting? Our cause is the next generation with specific focus on the next generation of leaders. And compare these three. You act for the environment, you protect human rights, or you develop the next generation. I, I, can't, I, I can't see anybody would say no to partner with an organization that is completely dedicated and capable to develop the next generation. Thank you. Uh, this was not a pep talk. <laughs> uh, it was actually from the bottom of my heart why I'm, I'm here as a, a businessman and a scout leader. Uh, and I really invite you guys to uh, now, also you on the internet, uh, I really invite you guys to comment upon what I'm saying and to ask questions. And I want to say that what I'm saying is actually not what everybody agrees. It, it is a very personal point of view, which uh, there are quite a few people that dis will disagree with. So you are perfectly allowed to disagree to express your concerns and what have you, because that's what makes this event uh, useful and valuable. And I have a microphone, and you actually should probably use both. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lars. Uh, I'm Peter Illig, uh, based in the Geneva office, Director of Global Projects. I'm also an Eagle Scout from Boy Scouts of America, and I just wanted to acknowledge that when I grew up, the most popular Danish association we had was your famous Danish pastry. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, Lars, uh, if you could 
give us some suggestions or ideas or when you talk about differentiating you know what's unique what are those differentiators that you see give us some examples that would make us stand out thank you should I use both microphones is that necessary yeah. it is not can I leave one okay you get it okay uh, I don't think there is is a translation Put on that one. Okay, what are the main differentiating factors that I see? The first thing is that we have such a precise focus on educating and empowering young people to act as respond as active citizens. Actually, that's Baden Powell's word. I've I've stolen that back from him. We've forgotten it, but actually he talks about active citizenship, and he contra he puts it at a contrast with passive citizenship, which is obeying the law. But that's not enough. He, what he says, scouts should actually go out and do something to create a better world. And that is why I translated it and rewrote it into active citizens capable of leading positive change based on shared values. And the first differentiating factor, I believe, is the fact that we are entirely focused on that. That's what we are doing. And we have a course that everybody can understand. We're concerned with the next generation. You guys, what are you concerned about? You know, I'm concerned about my sewage system, or I'm concerned about uh, my house may fall down, or what have you. We are concerned about the next generation. Wow, that's a differentiator, very powerful. The second differentiator we have is the fact that we are applying a unique method, which is completely in tune with modern cognitive science. We are building on a voluntary commitment by the young person. He or she gets in voluntarily, joins because he or she thinks it's fun, it's a nice place to be, want to be there, doing interesting things, makes a commitment through the scout promise and law to become the person that he or she wants to be, uh, which is expressed differently in different societies, but there's a voluntary commitment, which is a strong differentiating factor as well. And then there is the whole scout method, which leads to uh, that, which gradually develops the young person that is egoistic to become responsible, and the young person that is dependent to become autonomous. That is really what the scout method is all about. And this is a strong differentiator, and nobody in the world uses that method, which is surprising. I think those are the, and you may add the global nature of the movement, but there are many other global uh, youth movements, so that's not such a strong thing. It was 100 years ago, or 50, 80 years ago, but it is not so strong a differentiating factor today. That would be my answer. Anybody would add anything to that? Would you add? Uh, to, to this differentiation? Yeah. Oh, separate issue. For the differentiation, anybody would add something? Okay, let's take a new issue. That's you. Now, you're a, na a native English speaker. Speak slowly. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Lars, can I say thank you for a, a very enthusiastic uh, presentation? I'd like to offer a, um, a sobering um, experience. Uh, I'm from Scouts Australia, and we are not able to engage our federal government. We're not able to engage many philanthropists or um, business organisations in the way that we would like to. There are primarily two reasons. The first, Scouts are not good at marketing themselves. And secondly, we fail to be able to measure the positive impact of scouting. And yesterday, I threw this question out. How can we get better at measuring the positive impact of scouting? My personal view is that to engage with federal, state governments and with philanthropists, we need to demonstrate, we need to quantify what the positive impact 
of scouting is. A hard-nosed decision makers would have a positive impression of scouting, but we need to do more than that. We need to translate that positive impression of scouting to very quantifiable results. How can you help us? Thank you very much, Neville. I'm happy uh, to give you just a rundown of the pitch that I'm using when I go out and raise money for scouting from exactly these people. The first thing I say, do you know what scouting is? I never ask people if they have been scouts because we want money from people who have not been scouts as well. So the first thing I said, do you know what scouting is all about? And they will tell the activity story. And then you say, OK, you're absolutely right. But frankly speaking, scouting is not about what you see. It's about something you don't see. Uh -huh. And then what is it that you don't see? You see the smartest educational system backed by most recent cognitive science, which transforms dependent and egoistic young people into autonomous and responsible adults who are capable of acting like active citizens and leaders of positive change. That's what scouting is about. Which means, and then you tell the, the core story, you know Amnesty, you know Greenpeace. What do you think scouting's, aim, uh, scouting's cause is? The next generation. So the question to you is, how would you relate to an organization such as this one that is the greatest leadership development program on the planet and which is focused on the next generation. So now you have laid the ground. Now you have to argue why scouting is such a fantastic place to invest your dollars. And I will give you four reasons for that. The first one is that scouting is focused on young people and thus has a long-term effect of at least 50 years. And imagine what an investment you are making that has a 50-year positive feedback. Wow! And the feedback and the, the, the return gets greater each year because the person grows in responsibility, leadership position, what have you. So it's not a declining return, it's an increasing return 50 years from now. So it is a long-term investment. The second reason is that you're investing in enabling young people to lead positive change, which is to lead others. Leading others means that this person has a multiplier effect. So you are focusing on one, but frankly speaking, this one over the next 50 years will probably influence 200 or 2,000 others. So it has a much wider impact. The third point why you should invest in scouting is that, sorry, is that for every paid professional, every person that receives a salary, there are roughly 1,000 unpaid volunteers, such as me and many of you. There are 1,000 unpaid volunteers for every person that receives a salary. So you really get bang for your buck. All these people working for you for free. So there's impact like you can't imagine. And then we add a fourth point when we talk about the World Scout Foundation, which is really something that just makes people lie down and say, where, where, where should I send my check? OK, because then the fourth argument is that in the World Scout Foundation, all the operating costs of the foundation are covered by the board members. So your dollars will not go to pay expensive travel or anything like that. It will go directly to the scouts. That story is irresistible. It's a fantastic story. And the impact is unbelievable. So you can go out and do it. And if you want to persuade all these people, you should offer them a partnership. You shouldn't never ask for money you should offer them a partnership that will benefit them as well. Who doesn't want to be associated with the greatest leadership development program on the planet? Maybe come, you come up here so that 
our friends can see you. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, this is related to the just the concluded question. First of all, thank you so much uh, for the words of wisdom. I feel you. Uh, <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I learned this from the earlier session in the morning. You know, uh, my name is Conrad Natsi from Uganda Scouts Association. I'm the technology for development specialist. Uh, our association took a kind of paradigm shift to give the young people an opportunity, just like we had in the morning, to explore, take leadership, make the mistakes, and take it forward with the new technology that is up. Uh, with my friend Moses there, and all the guys who came here, actually we are kind of young people who are running the association. Uh, our focus for the last, fr last three years has been creating opportunities for the young people across the country. So we came up with all these cool and marvelous applications. You must have heard of your report, uh, your report, which is a mind-blowing application which we are uh, running globally now. Uh, we're coming up with a Minds Up application, which is a medical uh, mobile application where someone can get actually uh, prescription. Uh, the question is uh, appreciation and being valued. Uh, we create the opportunities for the young people, and I like the fact that you're in the line of business. But uh, there's exploitation that comes with being a voluntary organization. As much as someone is valuable and this, they say, you're a scout. You give your services. How do we tackle that aspect of uh, appreciation versus value? Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that that is maybe more difficult for you than it is for us uh, because if we if somebody wants us to perform free services uh, which is what you call exploitation if somebody wants us to do that we will return by saying okay how could we do that in a way that develops the leaders for tomorrow how could we do that and most likely we will be able to work out a solution that will be mutually beneficial for scouting and whoever wants us to do something. And if uh, we can't do that, we'll just simply say no. It's, a, it, it's like that. The one thing I'd like to just mention for you before we have the next question uh, is that if you look at the way businesses will be run in the future, and this is really why I'm in China, uh, I'm working with the Chinese to sort of jump ahead uh, to, to teach them or to give them an ability to learn how to run businesses in the 21st century logic and not the 20th century logic. What is interesting is that businesses that will be successful in the 21st century will actually engage their stakeholders to a much higher degree than we do today. And I can illustrate it very simply by saying that a conventional business will create value for the customer by selling the product to the customer and then will obviously get some money in return. The business of tomorrow will create value with the customer for the benefit of both. And you say, how the, is that possible? But just think of Skype, actually developed by a Danish team, uh -huh. <laughs> Danish-Swedish. Uh, think of Skype. That's an interesting case. Skype has 600 million subscribers. They've never placed an ad anywhere because all of us who are on Skype are actually unpaid Skype salespeople. Because if my friend in Australia doesn't have Skype, I will invite him, show him the link, what he should do, and if he has a problem getting the sound out of the machine, I'll tell him how to do it because I know it. So I'm not only a salesperson for Scout, I'm a customer service representative. And we create value for the benefit of both. I have no question Skype's benefits, but I benefit as well because I get free telephone calls to my friend in Australia. And you may say that's one single example. I can give you 50 examples of the same thing. That's the way businesses will function in the future. And the, the question of exploitation, we need to develop partnerships with external partners. It could be... King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia for messengers of peace 
which is definitely for the benefit of scouting and young people around the world, but it's also for the benefit of Saudi Arabia, of course. And there are, it was just one example I was looking to you, Dr. Hamad, uh, that's only fair. So we are working in partnerships, creating value for both parties, and that's the way to run a business in the 21st century. Okay, who's next? Yes. Uh, first, of, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you, Lars. You are a wonderful presentation. Uh, especially, uh, you said uh, scouting is bad in powers. Facebook, I thought it's the code of the day. Yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, my name is Jesse. I'm from Taiwan. I got one question. Is, uh, when we are talking about uh, leadership, I believe uh, there uh, must be uh, many things, lots of things uh, could be discussed. Uh, however, uh, if uh, in terms of uh, uh, scouting, uh, what will be the most important or most uh, important criteria uh, for developing uh, the, the, the leadership uh, capabilities, especially uh, for the young people, and why? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, actually, the, in the last three-year period since the last conference in Brazil and up to the Slovenia World Conference, there have been four priority areas in world scouting, and one of them is called 21st century leadership. And they have worked day and night to answer your question. Uh, and they have defined what leadership is in the scouting context. If I am to summarize that in just one sentence, I would call it active citizenship, leading positive change based on shared values. That's really the summary of what that is. Which means that uh, in the patrol, for instance, you know, now we're doing cooking, and you're really, really good at that, and so you are sort of the leader while we're doing cooking, and you are excellent in, in maintaining the fire, so you are a leader in that. And uh, I'm a good planner, so I'm planning what we to do after the, the, the coup, what we do next, etc. So in scouting, everybody can be a leader, and that's what differentiates us from, say, a business school, which makes it a competition you know, either you are the leader and I'm under you, or I'm the top guy and you're under me. That's not the way we understand leadership in scouting. I think that's the most prominent feature. But there is a nice report to be presented in Slovenia, and I'm sure you can get it right away, uh, because it's, it's available in draft form, on what leadership will be and should be in the scouting context. But if you want it brief, and I know I'm repeating myself, and I'm sure that when you walk out of this door, you will all say, active citizens leading positive change. That's what the whole thing is about. OK, you. Lars, my name is Barry Saunders. I'm from the United States. Um, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I know that a lot of us would think about, you know, we're likely not going to go out of here and go ask the uh, Sheikh of Saudi Arabia for $35 million <laughs> along with you. So how does this all impact on us? And I'd like to offer a couple of things that I think we can do and see if you would comment on those. First would be that marketing our product is a shortcoming. Uh, I think we've already acknowledged that we don't, we don't do a very effective job even of measuring what the ultimate outcome is. Although you could argue that a lot of that is kind of intuitive. I mean, if you create good citizens, there's a lot of examples of that. What we fail to do is we fail to market that very effectively. Uh, I know we get balled up in all of the things that the media likes to parade out about scouting and fail to tell the positive story. So one of the things that I think we should all do is to concentrate more on marketing what we're all about. Uh, and that's something that many of us can get in, involved with. The second thing is, is that we've got this ratio of a one paid professional to a thousand volunteers, and I would, I would say that most of us in this room spend most of our time trying to figure out what to do with those thousand volunteers in terms of training and development and et cetera. Some of us have the good fortune to actually work with young people 
face-to-face. Uh, -face. But most of us end up spending most of our time with committees and organizations and individual volunteers. And so I'd submit there's a couple of issues there that we could carry this kind of message out and do. One clearly is more effectively training the volunteers to have the perspective that we're trying to give to ourselves, which is the purpose is really the, the ultimate goal here, and we need them to concentrate on that. We do need to train our leadership more effectively in the methodology, but since methodology is really less important than the purpose, we need to concentrate on the purpose, and we need to kill some of the sacred cows so that we are less... Uh, unwilling to change the what. Uh, and those, I think, are two things we can probably concentrate on. I appreciate your comments on those. Thank you, Barry. I, I would actually offer one comment that addresses both points. And I would express a slight disagreement with you, uh, referring to David Hansen, who sits right here. He's the new chief scout of the Danish Guidance Scout Association a young, really, really sharp guy. And the two of us were discussing actually our strategy for growing, for having more impact, for being more successful, for positioning scouting better in society. And actually, David came up with, I think, what was a really, really interesting idea. Imagine if we stopped marketing scouting to young people, and if we focused fully all our resources on Recruiting, selecting, training, empowering, supporting adult leaders, voluntary adult leaders. If we created the best possible package to offer to adult voluntary leaders, and if, if we focused on getting more of them in, we agreed actually that in that case we just have waiting lists of young people wanting to get into scouting. And so that it would be my take on it, inspired by what David said. I would also add another comment, which is that I personally think, of course, we could do better marketing of what scouting is all about by having a clearer message and focusing on the why, etc., all of that. But frankly speaking, an even bigger challenge is what's inside our own brains, because we have a mindset of scouting being nice to have. And we don't see scouting as something we need to have. And that's the most fundamental problem. So you guys have to change your perception, in my view. You have to change your own perception first. Is scouting just something some crazy volunteers go out and do uh, on certain evenings and uh, weekends with young people to help them have fun and learn useful skills? Or is it the greatest leadership development program on the planet? You guys have to make up your mind. What is it, your perception? What is your mindset? And once you've made up your mind, you need to act differently. And then I personally think that marketing will be much easier and will be much more successful. We still have room for a couple of questions. Uh, open, yeah. It's your turn. I'm very impressed, inspired, what I heard. Thank you. In my NSO, I think we spent a lot of money and resources on training our leaders because we realized the, their importance. But to my mind, I think we forget about empowering them. Could you share some good examples how to empower, empower young people on 21st century? Uh, you, you might talk about empowering our adult leaders. I, I don't generally see that as such a big problem, uh, but let me address that. For an adult leader, if this person is focused on the why and understands the method and the value of the method, of course this leader should be given great freedom to act within that and to take advantage of local opportunities and what he or she thinks is fun, what have you, all of that. So. I would hope that the association empowered the, the, the adult leader to work that way and not enforce uh, their particular activities and what have you on that leader. I think we have an even greater challenge with the young people because we look upon young people as, or in general, many of us look upon young people 
as something that we do scouting for. In my view, young people do scouting. And we help them and empower them and assist them and support them and advise them. But they are doing the job. So the very basic aspect of scouting is that it is something that young people do and they are led by young people. And young people play a, an, a, an, a, a fundamental role in all decision making and everything we do. I think that's what our challenge is. And I think much of what we're doing in this movement builds on a, on a false mindset, which is that we do scouting for young people. We should enable young people to do scouting and empower them that way. That's the best answer I can give. Last question. I, we have two. So we have you, a short question, and then... Very, break. very short. Yeah, you're an author of Unboxing. Can you please explain to us in uh, greater detail how embossing um, is being embraced in the scouting movement? And I must really thank you very much because the sale of the book all goes to the foundation. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> very generous, huh? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for raising this point. Uh, I, I will not have time to give you a long story, but it is true that my last book is called Unboss, which doesn't mean the lack of leadership, but means a different sort of leadership. And if you, know, if you want to know what it's about, think of the best possible scout leader. This person is an unboss because he or she doesn't direct other people to do what he or she thinks they should be doing he empowers people to do what serves a common purpose. And he engages stakeholders and other people in making it happen. And he or she works according to a set of values, which means that what the company or the organization in, is doing adds positively to society. And you might think that that is only for NGOs. It's for business. And that's how the 21st century business will work. And Unboss is available on Amazon, on all platforms. <laughs> and as uh, you said, all the proceeds goes to the World Scout Foundation. Thanks a lot. OK, then Frederick? Yes. Yes, thank you, Lars, for this uh, very great presentation. I can stand here, or I should? It's OK, good. Well, yesterday, we had to go up there. Well, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And uh, now. I'm happy to have uh, maybe one of the last questions. Um, I agree with you, and it's not the first time for me to hear uh, your presentations, and it's very nice. And I would maybe uh, try to give, say that I'm slightly disagree uh, with you, even though that we are Danes, both of us, then uh, we have disagreements. Um, the idea about leading, I would also like you to maybe elaborate a little bit about following. So we are both capable of leading and follow positive change in society. And I think this following part is really great. Me, as a young leader in my NSA, I'm leading, but I also have a lot of followers, and maybe also older people that are following me, even though I'm, I'm young. And sometimes I also follow the older leaders and, and, and this uh, perspective. So a slight disagreement, and uh, maybe a little input in the end. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, for raising this point, uh, one of the chapters in the Unbus book that I worked most on was the one about what is the future employee. And that employee is what you refer to as a follower. It is somebody that just doesn't obey orders, but actually takes active part in co-creating the value that's the purpose of the whole thing. And scouts learn through the patrol system, through learning by doing, through everything we are doing, they learn actually to be both leaders and followers. And it is an essential part of our training that in some cases you are the leader, but in others you should uh, encourage other people to take the lead and you are the best possible follower. So you are absolutely right in making that point. And it actually inspires me to say uh, to you that scouting when we talk about leadership, don't get it wrong, we are not a school for top executives 
although a lot of top executives actually have been scouts. But that's not the purpose of it. It is a much broader definition of leadership that, and you will have it uh, in the, the outcome of this group, it's a much broader definition of leadership which includes followership as Frederick mentioned. So when we go out of the door and think of ourselves as the greatest leadership development program on the planet, bear in mind how we understand the term leadership. And I'm sure that we can get any uh, part of our organization, any sponsor, any company to join with us if we find them worthy to it. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful day.